conscience collectively gets singed and numbed the more we allow this into the church. We think we're doing something that's loving. It's not loving. to come into his house and to worship him and to lift him up. Uh, we serve a God who is, is good. We serve a God who is great. We serve a God who is mighty. And he's worthy of all the praise. Amen. Amen. I want to uh, start by reading a very familiar verse of Psalm, uh, Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of, righteous, of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I like verse 4 that says, uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There are so many things that are happening in our lives and in our world today, and it seems scary. We, it, it, we have a, a lot of opportunities to be afraid of, the, of, of, of COVID and of all of those things that are attacking us and that are coming against us. But this verse says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the reason why we don't have to fear is because God is forever with us. God is always with us. No matter what we're dealing with, no matter what we're going through, we're going to walk through it with his help. And he will be there to, to, uh, to comfort us and to, and to guide us in the way that we should go. And so take courage in, in, in that, in the fact that God will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just glorify you. We lift you up on this day. We praise you for everything that you've done for us. We praise you for how you've kept us, and we thank you for how you provide for us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that covers us, and your love that 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 uh, shield covers us uh, and covers all of our sins, dear Heavenly Father. I pray that you would be with us as we move in this service. That you would move by your Spirit. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that as the Word goes forth, you will help us, dear God, to understand and to to have the word going into our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, so that we can leave here and be better and not bitter, dear God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
And I love news, so I was perked up right away. And your instinct is some accident happened, uh, like a small little plane accidentally went off course and hit a building. And then about 15 minutes later, a second plane hit a second tower. And you start adding up that this isn't an accident. This is something else. And then a little more time passes. And you realize the Pentagon gets hit by a plane. Five stories of a section of the Pentagon are in flames. And I'm listening closer to the radio. I'm getting into work. Work doesn't even matter anymore. You start to just like, everyone's gathering around the radio and the news and trying to feel what's going on. And then what seems unthinkable because in my head, I don't live in downtown Manhattan, but I picture this gigantic building getting hit by a plane. News breaks that the building is collapsing. And it seemed unfathomable. How can this huge building collapse? People are panicked. People are in tears. And then another plane crashes in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Everyone on board dies. A terrorist act. And then there's word that now the North Tower that was hit by a plane earlier completely leveled at the ground. And so you start to see these newsreels come in and you see people covered in ash and you see all these heroes that risk their lives to save people. And you realize just how tragic it is. And it makes you angry. And then that night, <clears throat> September 11, 2001, President Bush got on the TV and he said some words about evil when he addressed the nation. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge structures collapsing have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. He continued, Today our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. The search is underway for those who were behind these evil acts. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Do you remember your feeling of anger that day? Sadness, those emotions that just take you over? I, just reflecting back on it, it makes me angry. It makes me sad. And you see these clips, because we've come up on this 20th anniversary of the planes flying into buildings. It, it never stops shocking me. And people in tears, and you hear the voicemail messages that are haunting left behind where people are saying goodbye. And that never leaves my mind. In fact, right after September 11th, it inspired 250,000 people to join either active or reserve military duty in that year following September 11th. There was a response. And so, where does this leave us 20 years into the future? Evil is still evil. We know it when we see it. And there's a desire for righteousness and justice that's in us. It inspires us not just as Americans, but more so as Christians, to want to do something. So how are we as believers standing against evil, promoting truth in the church? Mm -hmm. Because this is a Christian problem as well. Evil making its way into the church. Let's look at our text today, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is from the second letter of Timothy that Paul writes. And we know where he is when his world stops turning, because he's writing this letter from prison. And this time, some of the other letters we read, he's in prison, but it's more like a home prison where he would have, like in our minds, like a band on his leg. He's, he's got the freedom to do some things, to interact with people. In this situation, it's incredibly different. He's in a dark dungeon of a prison, and it's, it's uh, wet, and it's dark, and 
he is in chains, he mentions at one point in this passage. And he's getting towards the end of his life, and the end of his ministry, and he signals that with different things he says through this letter. And it reads like a letter. It should, right? It's a letter. So it's hard to just pull out a passage of this and make sense out of it. I, I encourage you, take a minute and read through this whole letter. It won't take you long. You feel like you're just catching part of it, what, what we cover today. But the whole letter has so much power for where we are today. He brings up a really specific message for his friend Timothy, who he's writing to. He's beloved. He treats him like a son. He's a fellow in ministry that he's trained up younger than him. And he's giving him this encouragement to guard the gospel. Persevere in the gospel. Keep on preaching the gospel. And then, if necessary, to suffer for the gospel. A chapter earlier from what we read in 2 Timothy uh, 3, Paul warns, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, Brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. As I was writing this out, there's all these little verse marks, one, two, three, four. It's like the longest run on of descriptives about all these people that we will face in, as, in adversarial conditions. We'll encounter people all the time that are challenging us, and that also happens within the church, and that's what Paul's warning him about. So Pastor Terry, he preached about this not too long ago, having this form of godliness and denying its power. It really inspired me to think about this and dig into it more. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness and denying its power. Let it sink in for just a second. This is happening in the American church. Compromise Christianity with watered-down standards and powerless people. Wow. What's Paul's solution to this? It's clear, have nothing to do with these people. Have nothing to do with these people. There's a big warning throughout this letter about false teachers, bad doctrine, things going south because we let it slip away and we lose sight of what truth is. And that's the heart of what this message is today, telling the truth. Paul continues in uh, 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That sounds dark, but this passage right here, it sets up the solution, the good news for us. The answers to this come from the Bible, and the Bible is our standard of measurement. We have the answers. This passage famously reads in 3.16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this is the setup that brings us to where we are today. We make a stand in the world with this message. We make a stand in the church with this message against evil and for truth. So the first way we're going to do that is to be prepared. That's what Paul is instructing Timothy it's important to underline what our job is here. In verse 1, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead? God's role is to judge the living and the dead. That's not our job. What's the idea that supports all of Paul's instruction to Timothy? Verse 2, preach the word. That's our job. Now, sure, Paul's writing this to Timothy, who's in pastoral ministry, but that's all of our job. Preach the word. You want a form of godliness without power? Don't preach the word. Be an imposter, as he says, going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We have the power of God's word, which Hebrews 4.12 reminds us, is alive and active. This isn't some antique that sits on a bookshelf with dust collecting on it. It's not just some historical book it's not a good teaching about a good man. Um, it's alive and active. It's not yesterday. It's today and tomorrow. It has power for us. It should be breathing life into us. Alive and active. Don't miss that part of it. It has the power to instruct how the church engages the culture that we're in today. 
and that culture that seeps into the church, the power of the Bible can instruct us because it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Be prepared by using the Word. The Bible gives us all the instruction that we need for how to deal with false teaching, bad teaching in the church, and letting the culture dictate our theology and tell the church how to operate. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.2 reads, it reminds us um, to be prepared in season and out of season. Well, let's be clear, God's word is in season all the time. But this means we need to be ready to discuss the word when you'd expect that you'd have to, like Bible study in church, over uh, the water cooler, looking over the fence, talking with your neighbors. That's in season. That's when you should expect to have to speak about the Word of God. And then when it's out of season, when it's difficult and challenging, because there's going to be times when we have to use the Word for correction, for rebuking, for having uncomfortable discussions with people that we love and we work with. That's when it's difficult. Second way we protect truth and resist evil, we rebuke and correct using the word. So let's look at correcting and rebuking just for a minute. Part of being made in God's image is knowing right from wrong. It's a compass that's inside of us. Mm-hmm. Even the worldly person, to a degree, understands right and wrong. They can identify it, and then they choose whether to follow it or not. The believer, however, has the Holy Spirit. We know right and wrong because we have the Holy Spirit guiding us, convicting us, keeping us on course. We know what's right and wrong more than just a hunch. The Holy Spirit guides us. But we live in an enlightened culture. That's, I'll put that in quotes, enlightened culture, because that's something that's happened for a couple hundred years, but in the last couple decades, that enlightened culture that values science and reason and sees that it can't coordinate with God, who is science and reason, knowledge, That enlightenment is not light, it's darkness. Mm -hmm. We don't realize often how darkness really can affect us and how dark it is at times. Truth is flexible from one person to the next, from one situation to the next. In 2021, we operate in a fantasy land where morality is relative and definitions can become blurry. The definition of marriage gets blurry. The definition of sexuality gets blurry. In the church, sure in the culture, in the church, pronouns get blurry. The definition of life gets blurry. Our conscience collectively gets singed and numbed the more we allow this into the church. We think we're doing something that's loving. It's not loving. We interpret truth and evil on our own terms, and the church is powerless because we've convinced ourselves we can play with the culture six days out of seven, and then one hour of that last remaining day, play church. And this weekend, on this last weekend, I had an interesting discussion that just kind of surprised me and caught me off guard. I was sitting with Jen and my sister. We were having kind of an adult discussion in the living room, and my nephew, who's a sophomore in high school, was just kind of listening in, doing something else. And we were talking, blabbing a mile a minute. And then there was a pause in the conversation, and he just kind of interjected. He said, out of nowhere, when did slavery end? And I just thought he was like off topic. I'm like, where is he going with this? When was it made illegal? And I thought about it. I said, well, you know, the Civil War ended in like the mid-1860s, so I, I guess like 1865 probably. He said, do you think 150 years from now, people will look back on us and wonder why we didn't do anything about abortion? And that's just it. That's from the mouth of a 15-year-old. This isn't a political discussion. This is a discussion about the sanctity of life. We think we're wise and we're learned and choice and all these things. It's the same discussion. And it takes the mind of a young Christian man to go, Something's odd about this. 
we're going to look back. People say, I don't want to do the wrong side of history. We're on the wrong side of history with this issue. We're on the wrong side of history because hopefully we do look back on this time and go, why didn't I do something about it? We have to ask ourselves, just like we would have about slavery, how could a society let human beings get treated this way? Because 100 years after the Civil War, we've still got segregation, right? And thankfully, thankfully, we look back on that and go, what a mistake, what an error. How could we have let human beings get treated that way? How could a society treat human beings that way? How could a society that professes Christianity allow human beings to get treated that way? You want a form of godliness without power, profess Christianity, look the other way and do nothing. We need to call sin, sin, evil, evil, with boldness, because we love people, because we love God, because we respect humanity, we respect His creation. I'm going to dial back the intensity for a minute and just let you laugh for a second. Verse 3 reads, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. In 1636, a long time ago, Harvard University was founded. And you know what the premise of founding Harvard University was? We think of it now. Ivy League, elite college. It was designed to be the center of for raising up ministers, developing clergy in the new commonwealth of Massachusetts. Okay? How do we prove that? Because it seems like they've strayed a little bit. The inscription on one of the main gates going into campus. This is what it reads. After God had carried us safely to New England, and we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the city government, one of the things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity. Dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. So they pass on this giant library of theological books and Bibles and literature that they have this conviction that after they're gone, they want to make sure that ministry lives on at Harvard. Their Latin motto established in 1692 Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae. Truth for Christ in the church. Now it's shortened to Veritas Truth. That's fine. Not really. But it's fine because it fits with the culture. Fast forward to literally this week, September 9th, and an article in the Harvard Crimson. It's their student newspaper. They're going to love this. The article's titled, An Atheist is a Perfect Choice to Lead Harvard's Chaplain. And I won't bore you to death, but this is how it starts. Last month, the Harvard Chaplains Organization, more than 30 university chaplains, made an eye-catching move that, believe it or not, promises to touch believers and non-believers alike. And a unanimous vote carried out by a select group of campus religious leaders, the organization elected humanist chaplain Greg Epstein, an atheist, as its president. A unanimous vote. More than 30 chaplains who believe and teach who knows what, electing a chief chaplain who's an atheist. This is what Paul's talking about in chapter 2. Godless chatter which spreads like gangrene. Let's go back to our passage today, 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, because it's right on key with this. Instead, to suit their own desires, they gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. This unsound doctrine that Paul's mentioning, it's here. It's, he says it's coming. It's here. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by it. Remember verse 317, God's word equips us for every good word. Without the Bible, without obedience to God's instruction, doctrine fails. The interpretation of Scripture starts to look suspiciously more like the culture than what's in the Bible. And people, yes, even professing Christians, will surround themselves with teachers who tell them what they want to hear. Because we know they're in churches in every city in this country. 
willing to scratch the itch of bad doctrine and tell people what they want to hear, what looks like the culture, appease the masses. Let's look at the third aspect of protecting truth and resisting evil, to encourage. This is the good news. To completely understand the power of the word, that we can apply the Bible to teach, rebuke, to correct and train in righteousness, perhaps most importantly, we have to appreciate how that happens. At the end of verse 2, Paul reminds Timothy, the heart behind correction and training in righteousness. Encouragement demonstrated by patience and care. Mm -hmm. What does this look like? Back in chapter 2, 25 and 26, Paul tells Timothy he needs to be kind to everyone. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And the patience and care he's talking about looks like what we see in verse 5. But you, keep your head in all situations. I like what the New Living says here. You should keep a clear mind in every situation. Keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. So here's the challenge, right? Following God's word isn't easy. We know that because we struggle and we make mistakes. And teaching about God's word, whether you're a minister or whether you're sharing with someone at the water cooler, isn't always easy either. But there's one takeaway here from Paul's teaching. It's what we just read. Keep a clear mind in every situation. Clear mind in every situation. A clear mind as opposed to what? Fuzzy. Don't let the truth be fuzzy. Keep a clear mind. The world wants to dictate our theology. The world wants to make things that are very clear, very fuzzy. Don't let the definition of marriage get fuzzy. Don't let the difference between the men's room and the ladies' room get fuzzy. Don't let the sanctity of life get fuzzy. Keep a clear mind in every situation. It might mean suffering for the Lord. It probably will mean suffering for the Lord. Thankfully, we're under pressure and not persecution of our lives at this point now. We don't know what could happen. But we're under pressure. We're under persecution. If you really make a stand, expect that. And embrace that because you know that's an indication that you're doing the right thing. If you don't have any persecution in your life, you need to question if maybe you're not doing the right things and standing up for the right things that the church needs to. So these are the facts. Living a godly life in Christ will bring persecution. But it's worth it. Evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. Deceiving people. And being deceived. Now thankfully we have a great body here at Community First. And I'm so grateful for that. So this message isn't so much to warn us about false teaching in the church. Although we all encourage accountability. I do. Pastor Terry does. We want feedback. We want to discuss things and work things out. And honor truth because that's what God wants us to do. Iron sharpens iron. We work together and reason through Him, using His Scripture as the standard for how we measure things, then truth always prevails. But these evil men that are in the culture and also put their ideas into the church, and we embrace them before we've even known we've embraced them, need to be resisted. Resist evil and don't be ashamed to tell the truth. That's our challenge. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Be bold. It may cost you persecution. It may cost you defriending on social media platforms. There may be implications where it adds harm to your life in this world, but the eternal consequences of not speaking the truth way outweigh any kind of uncomfort, discomfort you're going to feel from speaking the truth. Tell the truth. 
Lord, we're so blessed to live in a country that allows freedom. A country that's established on principles of freedom and worshiping you. My prayer today is that you would give us a boldness. We would listen to your direction, your standards, and keep a clear mind and follow your leading and be obedient to you. We would use your word as a guide and the accountability of Christian friends and mentors to also build strength in us, Lord. We would use your word as the standard for how we operate and determine truth. We would have conviction in us that we would live lives that honor you in every way. Thank you for all that you do, who you are, how you provide for us. In your name, amen.